Hi, it's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.co, a free site, my firm site. Always 1776.com, a free site. Today is Sunday, June 13th, 2021. Let's talk about an important part of the Kennedy assassination that, in my opinion, eliminates the possibility that the mob or some foreign government acting alone could have killed the 35th president of the United States. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there are many who believe that Carlos Marcelo, Santos Traficante, mob guys who felt betrayed by the Kennedy administration, who felt betrayed by Attorney General Robert Kennedy's investigation of the mob, right? The parading of people like Jimmy Hoffa in front of TVs for um, Senate and congressional questioning. There are many who believe that the mob upset at Kennedy killed the president, right? The problem with that theory is that there are certain things outside of mob control. Unless the mob had cooperation from people with control over things like the autopsy. I don't see how the mafia could have pulled this off, right? I recognize that Oswald's uncle was in the mob. I recognize that there are a lot of coincidences that are hard to explain, right? Jack Ruby traveling to New Orleans. Oswald, of all the cities in the United States, traveling to New Orleans in the months leading up to the assassination, right? But I want people to pay close attention to the autopsy because there are a host of weaknesses at Parkland Hospital who saw the president's wounds. There are even weaknesses with some of the best vantage points to the president's injuries who disagree with not only the autopsy but the pictures from the autopsy. What I'm going to do here because the best source are the people themselves is in the comment section of this YouTube video I'm going to put a link to episode one of a 1988 television series called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Now I understand that there are problems with some later episodes of the documentary series, but I need to have people understand that the documentarians interview people. John Connolly, for example, is interviewed in the first episode who were integrally involved in what happened on November 22, 1963. Now, the portion of episode one that I want people to focus on is 25 minutes and 30 seconds into the video. Again, it starts at 25 minutes and 30 seconds into the video. They're actually going to interview multiple doctors who were at Parkland Hospital who helped examine and operate on the president who, in their own words, tell you that the president had a hole, and it's a sizable hole, right? One to two inches. 
Another says seven centimeters at the back of his head. Now behind me is a photo from the autopsy. You're going to notice that somehow that does not appear in autopsy photos. Right? You have multiple people, multiple people at Parkland. These are trained medical professionals who see a huge hole in the back of the president's head. Now that's very important because a huge hole would imply that it's an exit wound, not an entry wound. And that a bullet came from in front of the president that blew off part of the back of his head. Let's go one step further. I'm just going to name names. We're in an internet era. You can... Google for yourself. These names, you can look at their testimony for the Warren Commission. You can ask yourself whether the photograph behind me from Kennedy's autopsy is plausible. Right? The people, some of the people, the medical professionals who saw a large hole in the back right hand portion of Kennedy's head, the parietal area, include nursing supervisor at Parkland Hospital, Audrey Bell. They include Parkland Hospital no nurse, Diana Boutrin. Now understand, she actually had to clean the hole in the back of Kennedy's head. And she had to put gauze squares into that hole in preparing the body for a casket, right? We're not talking about people who had cursory looks at the back of Kennedy's head. We're actually talking about people who were able to look at the hole and in some cases treat the hole in the back of Kennedy's head. Dr. Kemp Clark at Parkland Hospital, Dr. Charles Crenshaw at Parkland Hospital, Dr. Richard Delaney at Parkland Hospital, right? Now you, if you know the Zapruder film, you know that after Kennedy gets hit in frame 313, that Secret Service agent Clint Hill then jumps on the car. Jackie Kennedy seems to be reaching for a part of the president's body that's been blown off. And of course, it's coming off the back of the car, right? She jumps out of her seat. She's to the left of the president, and she's reaching for, it seems, part of the president that's coming off the back of the car. Right? Not matter that flows into the car, but matter that's coming off the back of the car. Now, Clint Hill jumps on the car to get Jackie back into her seat and to cover up the wounded president. Now, just understand that history will show, and I want people to Google this quote, that Clint Hill testified that when he was up on the car, in his words, I noticed a portion of the president's head on the right rear side was missing and he was bleeding profusely. Let me repeat that. I noticed a portion of the president's head on the right rear side was missing and he was bleeding profusely. Well, understand, hours later, Clint Hill is taken to the morgue for the purpose of viewing the president's wounds. Let's remember, Clint Hill is Secret Service. And, of course, he again saw the large defect 
on the back, the right hand side of the president's head. Right? An argument can be made that nobody had a better view of the president's wounds after the president got hit in the limo than Clint Hill. Right? Now what I want people to do is I want people to look closely at the photo behind me. You can also see this photo and other autopsy photos on Wikipedia. If you Google the JFK autopsy. I want folks to do their own research. But let me just ask a dumb question here. How is this photo of the back of JFK's head after he's been killed, even possible. Well, what I want people to do is after they start looking at the film clip that I've linked to the comment section of this video, starting at 25 minutes and 30 seconds, I want you to let it run a little bit. You're going to hear from one of the people who helped put President Kennedy's body into a very expensive bronze casket. Right? One of the people who helped insert the president and who was aware of how the president's head was wrapped. The fact that with a lot of care and respect and dignity the president's body was placed in very expensive casket and then transported to Bethesda, Maryland, where the president underwent an autopsy. You also have a person who was present on the other end after the president was transported to Bethesda, Maryland. Now let's just say that there is a question here. And in the video you hear from the people themselves. Right? Trust no one. Listen to the folks' recollection. And just ask yourself a question. When the president arrived in Maryland, was he in the same casket? Right? Just listen to the descriptions given by the men in two different locations in the link to the video that I have here. Again, it's episode one of the men who killed Kennedy. Right? Whatever faults that documentary series had in terms of the filmmaker's own views just understand that you're hearing firsthand from the people who were actually involved what they recall. Right? I believe there's an open question on whether the president was delivered in the same casket in which he left Dallas. I believe that's an open question given the statements of the people involved. That's an open question. So, what I want people to do as we try to figure out what happened on November 22nd, 1963, I want people to ask themselves, if Carlos Marcelo wanted to get rid of what he called, according to history, a stone in his shoe. And if the mafia decided to kill the 35th president of the United States, would the mafia have the capability to change the autopsy? to come up with photos like the photo behind me. What I want people also to do 
And you have to have a strong stomach for this. I want you to go to the Zapruder film and look at frame 313 and the frames after it. Just focusing on the president's here in the back of his head. What I believe you're going to see, well, what I saw, is his hair gets pushed to the side. Right? That that headshot that hits the President of the United States damages the back of his head right around the ear area. Right now, folks, my own two eyes and my own observation of frame 313 and the succeeding frames of the Zapruder film are inconsistent with the autopsy photo behind me. It's just inconsistent. You'll notice the ear below the flap. The hair goes right up to the ear. There's no distortion. I don't believe that any criminal enterprise outside of government would have the capability of altering in any way the autopsy of an assassinated president. If the Mafia was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy, and I'll concede, Jack Ruby certainly is in touch with a lot of mobsters in the weeks leading up to the assassination of the president. We know that from the House Select Committee on Assassinations from the 1970s. Right? But do you believe that a Jack Ruby, without some kind of government cooperation, would have the power to actually interfere, distort, change an autopsy? or would have the power to possibly be able to change the casket that the president was in. Again, I'm leaving the link in the comment section of this YouTube video. I'm going to try to leave the link in the comment section of my podcast, right? which can be found at DeWireBoxingNews.com. But again, I want you to compare the picture in back of me here that's part of the president's autopsy with the statements from the doctors at Parkland Hospital in the video link that I have put in the comment section of this video starting at 25 minutes and 30 seconds in. That's how I see it. Let me hear your thoughts. Let me also point out something, too. Were Oswald to have gone on trial for the assassination of the president, had Oswald lived, what impact would it have had if you would have had several of the doctors at Parkland Hospital, if you would have had Aubrey Reich in fact, let's back up a little. If you would have had Audrey Bell, nursing supervisor at Parkland Hospital, as well as Diana Boron, who tended to the president's wounds, put gauze on them before putting him in the casket, if they would have come forward and testified that their recollections differed with the presidential autopsy. What would have happened if Oswald was represented by competent defense counsel who would be able to say, whoa, wait a moment. If, in fact, these medical professionals 
right? Not expert witnesses, percipient witnesses who actually saw the president and who are testifying about what they saw are telling you that the president had a one to two inch hole in the back of his head. Isn't that consistent with a shot from the front? And also, isn't the prosecution, by trying to present to you this autopsy, which shows the back of the president's head intact, aren't they pulling your leg? How can you trust them to find anyone, especially a shooter from the back, who, of course, took a paraffin test and did not have gunpowder residue on his cheek? In other words, the gunpowder test is consistent with Oswald not firing a rifle. And, of course, of the four people who saw someone in the window with a gun, right? One person, Amos Owens, claimed that the guy was bald, right? Other people claimed that the guy was wearing a white shirt. Howard Brennan refused to pick Oswald out of a lineup. How could any jury, based on this record, find Oswald guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? I look forward to your thoughts in the comment section of this video and in the comment sections of my podcast. I thank you for stopping by.